Hey guys, so today I wanted to talk with you about my entire knee surgery experience. You might know or you might not know that about two years ago I had a pretty major surgery on my left knee and honestly it had been a very long time coming. I've been dealing with knee issues since I was literally six years old and <laughs> they've kind of just gotten worse. I kind of just wanted to share my experience and really go into detail because I know that when I was going through the surgery or you know right before I was trying to look at YouTube videos and there were a few and they were so helpful but they weren't extremely detailed and they also didn't um, go you know into two years after any surgery so I just sort of wanted to talk about that. Also, this video is sponsored by NatraCure, so if you want to potentially win some free ice packs, and specifically an ice pack that works for your knee after recovering from surgery, stick around to the end because I'll tell you how you can enter. So let's get into it. So why did I get the surgery and also what surgeries did I get? So the two surgeries that I kind of got combined were an MPFL reconstruction or a medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction. That is the ligament that attaches your patella to your femur and it holds your kneecap in place, or at least it's one of the things that holds your kneecap in place. Mine was very stretched and it had been torn in the past, um, so that really needed to be replaced. Then the other surgery, which was kind of the bigger of the two surgeries and the one I was hoping I would not have to get, um, is called a tibial tubercle osteotomy or a tibial tubercle transfer. It sounds a little bit worse than it is, but it is still kind of bad anyway. They saw off the very top part of your tibia, which is called the tibia tubercle, and they move it over and they drill it in place. This was in an attempt to help stabilize my knee. So that kind of brings me into why did I get this surgery? Basically, I have been having knee problems since I was six years old. I first subluxed my knee when I was six, and this is where your patella, your kneecap, moves over really quickly and really painfully way too far. And my knee would swell, I would struggle to walk for a few days and it was so painful. And this happened a bunch of times, but it wasn't until I was eight years old when I actually dislocated my knee. After dislocating it, I was using a wheelchair, I was using crutches for a little while and going to physical therapy. And luckily I was able to get my knee a lot better than it was before. However, it was still subluxing and causing me some issues. But I'd say it subluxed twice a year up until I was 18 and when I was 18 I dislocated it again and I was honestly literally just walking and it dislocated I was trying to tell myself it was a subluxation but it was a dislocation <laughs> um, because after that moment every single time I took a step my kneecap would move and move a lot and it was uncomfortable it was painful i would be standing and i didn't want to move my left leg so i would try to do everything with my right leg because even just bending it my knee would just move so freaking much it was really uncomfortable walking was terrible i didn't realize this but it was actually causing me some arthritis and that's because my kneecap was like moving in its socket and destroying some of the cartilage below it but luckily my arthritis isn't too bad so in addition to the two surgeries the mpfl reconstruction and the tibial tubercle uh, transfer they also did something called a chondroplasty they kind of just cleaned up that arthritis that I have below and luckily it has not progressed and it is now two years since I've had my first surgery I also had a second surgery to get rid of my screws because they screw in your tibia so that's sort of the the overall thing and the most important thing for me to say is that I do heal slower than a lot of you are going to heal because I have a condition called hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is a genetic connective tissue disorder and it affects healing. It causes a lot of hypermobility, like lax ligaments, um, but that's not the only cause of lax ligaments. A lot of people have joint hypermobility and they don't have EDS. I also have a lot of systemic issues because of it. I have POTS, autonomic dysfunction, um, and some other things too. And just to answer the last part of why I got this surgery, the real reason is because my knee would not stabilize. I have seen, literally, let me count the number of physical therapists that I have seen from the time I was six until now for my knee. 
I can think of eight different physical therapists, nine different physical therapists who I've seen specifically for my knee over the years. And many of them have lasted multiple years and my knee would not get better. So I just wanna say my timeline, if you don't have EDS, will probably be a little bit longer than yours. Hopefully you will heal a little bit better than me. So let's hop into the day of the surgery. So for the day of surgery, I was really nervous, but I went in and, you know, it was fine. It wasn't as bad as I was thinking. In certain ways, it was worse than others. I got an epidural and that was to, I guess, like numb the lower half of my body or something like that. They actually did it for me when I was under anesthesia, which I thought was fantastic because I've heard that usually like, they do it beforehand just to make sure that it worked. But I think they put me sort of in that in-between state at first, like a twilight state. So that way I could respond, but I don't remember it. Surgery was, I think, two to three hours. And when I was done, I woke up. I do think I was in quite a bit of pain, but nothing unmanageable. The main thing was that I was extremely, extremely nauseous. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, I'm in the hospital right now. So um, when I woke up at the epidural, I had worn off, at least in my opinion, because I wasn't numb at all. So I'm almost nauseous, but I'm like dizzy every time. Oh, sorry, I'm dizzy and nauseous every time I sit up. So I'm trying not to sit up. Um, my leg hurts right now. Probably the most it has so far. But it's not like unbearable, it just, you know, like hurts quite a lot. I ended up staying two nights and three days in the hospital. Um, and that's because I stayed a little bit longer than like what kind of what, I guess, what they're expecting, but I think a lot of people do what I did anyway. And that's because I was just so dizzy, I could not get up on my own. Hey guys, so I am feeling so much better than the last time I spoke with you it is crazy. Um, I'm staying another night. The ideal protocol was just one night, but not happening. I'm staying too, and then I'm really, really hoping I'm going out tomorrow. I think I'll be totally fine. Um, when I went home, I could not crutch on my own. And I actually had special crutches made for me because I have like a weird situation with my wrist and I can't put much weight on it this way. So they made a platform crutch for me, which was awesome. But when I was crutching, I could not put my knee down at all. Like I could not let my leg go down because the blood pooling would happen immediately. It was so ungodly painful. Like it was just so painful. So when I would crutch, I would have my mom or dad or somebody hold my leg at 90 degree angle. And I did that for three weeks. It wasn't, I did that for two and a half weeks. It wasn't until two and a half weeks where I was finally able to crutch on my own. And that was still only for short distances. Um, so really those first few weeks are really, really hard. One thing I would recommend to you is getting a bedside commode. I would not recommend that if you had the MPFL reconstruction. I think it's very different, but with the tibial tubercle osteotomy, you can't put any weight on it whatsoever for six weeks. So it is hard to get around, and especially those first few weeks where you can't crutch on your own. Maybe you can, but I couldn't. We had a caregiver come for me, which was really great. I'm so happy we had that because my parents both work and I needed a lot of help for those first six weeks. But even still, it was very, very hard on me emotionally. And I think you'll find that it will be a really hard first few weeks, but you will totally make it through. I was on pain meds for about 11 days, I wanna say, um, but they really, really messed with my eyes and like my pupils and I just couldn't read. I couldn't watch TV very much. It was very hard. So I stopped them a bit earlier than I feel like my knee wanted me to, but I was taking Tylenol and Advil all the time. I think I was taking four Advil every four to six hours. And then I was taking two Tylenol, I think every eight hours. So I was really, you know, really up on those over the counter pain meds. So something I did literally constantly was ice my knee. I had an ice machine and then the ice machine broke and then I got another ice machine and then that ice machine broke. And so it was kind of really annoying. But anyway, I was icing my knee all the time and my swelling was looking really good. Now, while I did not have this at the time, I think this is something that would have been so extremely helpful for me from the six week mark on. Natricure makes this really cool ice pack. I've mentioned it in a video 
video in the past. Um, and it actually combines ice and compression, which is so helpful for surgery recovery, injury recovery, um, arthritis, anything that really you think compression and ice will help. When I would go to physical therapy after my session, they would use like a really big machine that compressed my knee and also iced it. And I love that thing so much. So while this is not that huge machine, this is kind of like a at home version that natra cure makes so i know i would have been using that constantly if i had that at the time also as you get a little bit later into your recovery it's so helpful to put heat and compression on your knee at least for me it feels really good and it can be helpful for scar tissue so this can be used for both icing and the heat natra here is actually really kindly doing a giveaway for you guys so somebody will win technically four ice packs because the first one is a flexi cold standard two pack the next one is the flexi cold oversized extra large one it's like really big so that's good for a back or to wrap your knee i used to do that a lot and also this hot and cold knee brace that you can use with compression. So if you're interested in entering the giveaway, all you have to do is follow Natricure's Instagram account and then follow my Instagram account and then um, comment down below what your Instagram handle is so that I know that you entered and we will reach out to you. So for weeks seven through 20, now, one thing that I was dealing with is that my quad strength was really, really behind. And oftentimes I see that with EDS patients is that our mobility is great. I was so good. I could bend my legs so quickly, but my strength was so behind and my legs looked so scary because they just lost so much muscle tone. The matra, oh, so how the, this muscle yeah, dips like in. It dips yeah. in completely. Like it's very yeah, weak. wow. Isn't that kind of gross looking? It's like, like not gross it's looking. It's not actually but... gross. It's just like, surprising like i wouldn't expect to see that whereas like this one like you lift it and it's like doesn't do that yeah, it doesn't you know do that. doesn't do like at all like that's like, yeah i can like dip. feel it right it's like this one does not have a calf muscle anymore so beautiful but that just means that once i'm able to start doing pt i just have to work really hard but i started pt at week six from six weeks on i was doing it twice a week and i would also do my exercises at home at week seven i was still using my wheelchair to get around if my parents were pushing me, or I could go a really short distance on my own, like maybe two blocks with my crutches. So that was really great. I was gaining some independence, but I could not go far. If you are living in like a suburb or something and you could you have a car, I don't think it'll be so much of a problem. You can definitely get around. But I live in Manhattan, so it's a little bit of a different story. I am in the car for the first time ever. Wait, that didn't make sense. For the first time in four weeks. I am so, so, so happy. It wasn't as hard as we thought. We were a little bit worried about getting down to the garage and then getting in the car and then putting the actual wheelchair in the car, but I knew how to undo it. It was really easy actually, and uh, everything worked out really well. So I'm in the car right now. What I'm doing, since I have to keep my legs straight, let me show you. So I'm just sitting here and I put my leg to the side on there and it worked out really well. It was probably around maybe week 14 that I was feeling a lot more independence. I was still using crutches unless i was walking throughout the house i could i didn't have to use them i started taking actually as week 18 this is what i have here i was able to take a really short step up which was so exciting and at this point i am behind so i'm a few weeks behind what you will probably be at you'll notice that a lot of the recovery is really just physical therapy and hanging in there and icing So as I started to approach maybe like nine months into recovery, I was definitely behind on the pain scale and the amount of activities I could do. When I touched my tibia, it hurt and it hurt a lot. Um, in fact, we were actually kind of concerned earlier in the process that I may have done something to my tibia and that sort of set me behind as well. I didn't do anything to my tibia. It was fine, thank goodness. But um, you know, it, it just like things didn't feel so great. And I think it really came down to me healing very slowly. One thing we tried to do to help that was hyaluronic acid injections. And I have a video of them doing this and it, it kind of hurt a little bit the last time that they did it, but for the most part, it doesn't hurt. And I do think it helped, so that's nice. It's supposed to help for arthritis. I use the smallest needle possible. So. All right, you're just feeling me find the spot, just fingers and plastic right now. 
and you're gonna feel freezing cold spray. This numbs up the skin. Deep breath, one, two, three, and pinch. And no fluid to take out. You can see the ultrasound Whoa. over there. Good. I can take that picture. Good, all done. But in the end, you know, I really was having a lot of pain in my tibia. And one thing I could not do, for example, was like if I could not kneel. And I still can't really kneel, but I can kneel on a soft surface now. Um, but also just walking around really hurt. My hamstring started killing me. Um, it was getting really tight, really, really, really tight. So we decided that in August of 2020, I was going to get my screws removed. Yes? Okay, so I'm in the car now. Um, I've not, oh, I can take off my thing. I have not been able to speak at all. So um, I have not updated yet. I haven't had my phone. It hurts, like, definitely, but. Um, it's like not horrible. Like it's nothing like it was the first surgery time, but I'll update more when I get home. And now we're just driving back. Okay, it hurts, but it's okay. And I'm actually really happy I did that because I do think my knee has gotten better since doing that. It's not perfect. Um, and it's now almost a year since that last surgery. Um, and I did have some complications from that surgery that was really annoying. Um, but anyway, I'm happy I got that surgery. I do think it made it a lot better than it would have been if I did not get them removed. Um, my doctor said about a third of people get them removed. So like, it's kind of your decision slash like her recommendation. And so she was like, I would get them removed if I were you. I think you should do it. I think it will help. And it did help. It didn't make it perfect though. I still can't like, if I, I don't think I would ever do this, but like if I try to crawl on this like hard wood, that would really hurt it. But I can kneel like on a soft surface. I can kneel on the couch, whereas before I could not do that. So where am I today and was it worth it? Overall, holy crap, it was so worth it. I like so, 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 so worth it. If you're dealing with such severe instability that you need to potentially get a surgery, like a tibial tubercle osteotomy, and then you end up with a knee like mine that still kind of hurts sometimes, isn't perfect, is it worth it? Oh my gosh, yes. I always say I could fight through pain. I cannot fight through instability. It is literally impossible and it's really damaging. So I'm so happy I got it. If you're wondering the things I can do, I can squat. I've been able to squat for a long time. I think I started doing that pretty early, maybe like three or four months in. Um, maybe even, yeah, probably three months in. If I needed to kind of jog across the street, I can do that. I don't know if I could run if I wanted to, but I, I really shouldn't be running anyway. Um, just because like it also really sort of sets it off like sometimes at nighttime I'll be in like a decent amount of pain Maybe like once every three weeks one night It'll hurt me and then I just ice it and make sure you know take an Advil or something and it's fine the next morning um, It's like not the best knee ever But it is pretty darn good especially compared to what I had before there was like not even an ounce of like regret that I did this surgery because it really is just so stable right now. I spoke to somebody before my surgery and she recovered so well and so much better than me and was going so quickly. She was going on a hike at six months and I was like, oh my God, I'm like, I think I'm still using a crutch at that point. Um, and that was like sort of discouraging to see because when I was at that point, I was very much behind. But just know that like, if you're talking to your doctor, they might not even give you a timeline because it really depends on the person and it depends on how quickly they heal. And if you have EDS, you probably will heal slower. I think the assumption is my knee, my knee will never be perfect, but it'll be pretty darn good. I actually want to answer some of your questions now because a lot of you had some great questions that I wanted to mention in this video anyway, so I can do that in the question section. How long was I non-weight bearing? So I was completely non-weight bearing for six weeks and then I slowly started to wean um, onto my legs so that I could walk with the crutches. Um, I would walk with both crutches, but I would still be able to put basically full weight on my leg or mostly full weight on my leg. Um, 
that took that process took me a while so let me quickly see how long that was okay so i could walk with crutches with full weight on my leg i think at week yeah i think by, by week 10 i was using both of my crutches and putting weight like full weight on my leg and then i was off of my crutches um by the beginning of november i was not using them at all to get around um i was in o all of october but i could like walk throughout the house in august um at like late august without crutches i got my surgery june 14th for um reference are there any extra precautions you took due to eds yes so i think most people who get this surgery they use their own body to make the, the MPFL. So they actually take it from one of your hamstrings and they turn it into like a ligament and they put it in your, where your MPFL is. Um, but for me, they did not do that for two reasons. First, they don't want to open up my body even more and cause another scar, require more healing. So they did not want to take anything from my hamstring. And then also because I have EDS, um, my ligaments are stretchier, my tendons are stretchier, everything is stretchier. So it's probably better to not use your own body for that. So they actually used a cadaver hamstring. Um, so yeah. I should also add that they made me see a cardiologist and do an echo. I don't know if they do that for everybody. I feel like they always do um, just like an EKG, which they did as well, but they had me do an echocardiogram and they did not have me do that for the next surgery a year later. So I don't know if that was really a precaution, but it may have been. What was the process of getting referred and what were the tests before you decided that you needed it? Great question, because I actually didn't get too much into this. I also kicked my camera, so hold on. So the first test that I got when I was after the age of 18 was a, um, a MRI and it showed that like I think it showed a couple things you know like a few small issues in random places um, and like a lot of scarring to my um, IT band which I know I did I know that was my fault because I rolled my um, my, my IT band so hard for so long trying to stop my knee from like moving out that I totally did that. I, appar I apparently have like pretty bad deep scarring to my IT band. Anyway, okay, so I did the, um, um, the MRI and it showed like some issues with my um, MPFL, but it didn't look too bad. Um, and anyway, but when the doctor felt it, he first said, I think you have to do the MPFL reconstruction. I didn't want to do it. I was too scared and I uh, left. Uh, my later self is taking over for a moment because I became very confused and I forgot literally everything. So anyway, <laughs> I then went back to school in St. Louis and I saw another surgeon there. I told him I was not getting surgery from him, but I just, I wanted someone to confirm that I really needed the surgery and if I needed just the MPFL. He said, you need the MPFL. You also need the tibial tubercle osteotomy. Um, basically they do this thing where they measure the distance between your patella and your um, tibia tubercle and I believe that if it's so if it's less than 15 it's normal if it's between 15 and 20 you're borderline abnormal and then if it's greater than 20 it's abnormal and they might recommend doing the tibia tubercle osteotomy so mine depending on when you measure it because it always changes the number a bit it's usually around 24 or 25 sometimes 22 like you know it, it kind of just goes around the place but it was always above 20 so i was like okay sounds good i guess i'll have to get the surgery in new york but then i got nervous again and i said let me go see another surgeon so i saw another surgeon in new york and i was hoping she would just say i have to do the mpfl i don't know i'm just ugh. so she said i have to do the mpfl and the tibia tubercle osteotomy but she was kind of worried because i had arthritis in my knee according to the mri and also she could tell that my that my antiversion um and my femur so it's called ephemeral antiversion was kind of bad and i also have a external tibial torsion so my knee my like tibia turns outward while my femur turns inward um it's actually technically called miserable malalignment syndrome whoever named it that i think you're hilarious um and she was worried that i would might need to do a distal femoral osteotomy and just to make sure that like the actual knee will end up working after all the other surgeries but luckily it was not bad enough she had me do a cat scan and she said no you can get away without doing it so that was quite a relief and then she also did a couple i think she maybe did another mri i don't know just a checkup on the arthritis and she said i don't need to do like an arthritis 
like graft maybe i don't know she was gonna grow some cartilage for me i think but she was like you're good you don't have to do it so hallelujah so there's just kind of a lot of tests involved and a lot of like numbers that they want to make sure you fall above um or actually really fall below so that they don't need to do those tests i mean so that they don't need to do those surgeries but if your tibia is too far laterally from your patella like it can make your mpfl surgery not work um so yeah <laughs> I also forgot to say I have something called, it's called a uh, trochlear dysplasia, which is like where your patella is supposed to be sitting in a groove within your femur. And like kind of, you know, just like it sits there, it's its little home. And if it's too flat, your patella can't really sit there very well. Um, so I have, I think it's severe. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I have severe trochlear dysplasia. Um, so that makes it even worse. Like I just have a lot of these risk factors that make it likely for me to dislocate my patella and my patella kept dislocating and subluxing. So that's kind of what qualified me, but prior to that, what actually qualified me was the fact that I've had multiple dislocations and multiple subluxations that have not gotten better with like rigorous physical therapy, bracing and other things. Um, so that's like the main thing. Do you have residual pain in your knee after surgery? I do. It's not as bad as pain as the pain I used to have, but some of the pain that I get is like at nighttime, it just starts to get really achy and painful only sometimes. Sometimes I get a really sharp pain in the MPFL that they like reconstructed um, and it'll hurt with each step I take and it will go away sometimes in three minutes, sometimes in an hour, but sometimes I feel a little bit stranded wherever I am because each step is very painful. So I might need to kind of like almost hop or limp um, for like sometimes, I kid you not, 45 seconds. And I'm like, why was it so painful? And now it's fine. Um, so yeah, but it like, it's not that bad in general. It's not very painful at all. Do I trust my knee more after my MPFL surgery? So much, oh my gosh. Like I would just be scared to pivot in the past, like walking, the amount of, the amount of thought that I have on my knee at all times without even realizing it was so much. Like it's like your body is just so focused on it because it was so unstable. When did I decide it was time for surgery? I decided it was time for surgery after I did three years of physical therapy from three different physical therapists. Two of them worked together and that was at Wash U and then one of them was here in New York and all three of them said, I need surgery. It's like not getting better. Um, and they said, you're working hard. Like I'm, I'm a really good uh, physical therapy patient because I always do my exercises. Um, but they were like, it's not getting better. It would have gotten better. I'm sorry, I think you need to see a surgeon. So that's when I decided to see a surgeon. But I still was sort of denying it for a while. But I, at a certain point, I guess it was just that I, I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. Like, and it hurt. And I got so nervous about the arthritis. Like, you don't want osteoarthritis at a really young age. That's, like, not fun. Now I think I'm fine. Thank God. My arthritis looks totally fine. It looks the same as after they, they shaved it a little bit and they fixed it after my first surgery. My knee looks, still looks really good. They actually went in with a scope after my for my second surgery. They scoped it out and they said it looks looks good how does an mpfl and tto compare to an acl reconstruction or she said acl i'm assuming that's what you mean um i believe my guess is that mpfl is pretty similar to acl recovery it, it sucks it hurts it's not fun it takes a little while but like you can walk on it pretty soon after you can go to physical therapy pretty soon after it was really the tibial tubercle osteotomy that was the bad part of the surgery. So I would say that's my guess is a lot worse than an ACL recovery. However, I would say that the MPFL was probably more painful. And like, that was kind of the thing that was really hurting me after surgery. I could be wrong, but it's just that the MPFL like doesn't require as many restrictions. Like an ACL would be kind of the same. Whereas the tibia one, it's like, you can't walk, you can't do this. And so, and it lasts so much longer. I think MPFL is four to six months recovery. To be tubercle to be osteotomy gosh is 10 to 12 months so big difference but even still like any knee surgery that like uh, it's not it's not fun you know is it common with heds no ow it is not common in general this is not a common surgery to have most people who have a dislocation probably won't have another one or at least like not another bad one and they don't need the surgery or PT helps. But for like the fraction that do, I don't think it's like that uncommon for the fraction that do, this is still not even a common surgery to get. It's hard to get. Like I don't think that many doctors do it. 
They probably do the MPFL, but the TTO is like a newer surgery, I think. But is it more common amongst EDS? Yes, but it's not common. I mean, in my personal life, I don't know anybody who's ever gotten the surgery before. On Instagram and Facebook, I've had a, I mean, Instagram and YouTube, I've had a bunch of people tell me they've gotten the surgery, and yeah, a bunch of them have EDS. And I joined like a, a good group on Facebook, not YouTube, um, when I was getting the surgery, and a bunch of people on there had EDS because it makes you more likely. How long did it take you to get back to normal? Um, I would say, Mm, it's really hard to answer that question. I don't know because it's like am I back to normal now? I don't know. It's been two years like I'd say I was pretty happy a year later It probably no, no, no. no undo. I'd say it took me 15 months to feel pretty darn good with it I mean I felt good before but I'd say like the pain wasn't too bad like it, yeah, 15 months again I heal slowly so that's probably 12 months for regular people I think it's 10 to 12 months. It, yes, that's actually right. I was told regularly it's 10 to 12 months full recovery. So mine was um, probably like 15. So yeah, I really hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions. I will try my best to answer them. And I also have some more specific videos from that time. I will link them all down below. See you guys on the next video. Bye.